Hi everybody, we're here today with Jorge Almeida. He's going to talk to us very shortly about some very creative, creative lessons in life. Tell him a little bit about what you're gonna talk about. So we're gonna go through my journey of a creative madman or admin. Uh, we're talking a little bit about uh, culture as well uh, and just overall talking about connections. So it's, it'll be great. Yeah, he's an overachiever, you gotta watch. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Dallas Culture Club Podcast. For those who seek to create meaningful connections with other purpose-driven locals in a more authentic relationship with yourself. I'm your host, Carrie Horn, founder of Passion Dallas Media. And through these talks with my incredible guests and my own life experiences, I'm going to show you that the secret to building a more connected and joyful life is through your conversations and cultural experiences. Come on, let's dive in. Hey Dallas, we are super excited to be back with you today for episode three, season one of the Dallas Culture Club podcast. On the podcast, you have the opportunity to hear the stories of local creative leaders who are shaping the culture of our city. And today we have one very awesome guest, Jorge Almeida, is a marketing extraordinaire and avid running enthusiast, a recent SMU MBA graduate and digital marketing manager at Avocados from Mexico, and now the leader of Go Running Tours Dallas, Jorge adds creativity and positivity into our city by really showing up for people. Without further ado, let's listen in to my multifaceted conversation with Jorge Almera. So we're here today. You're so special. I just have to say that. <laughs> With Jorge Almeida. Yes. Is that right? That's right on the money. I love that. And you know what just stands out to me about you that I think of every time I hear your name is you always seem to have time for everybody. Like it's very much a part of your personality. <laughs> I don't know if that's intentional. It feels <laughs> intentional that you see people and that if they come asking for you in any capacity that you always show up. Is that a truth of your personality or am I picking up on something just because? I'll answer that it's unintentional, but but I've become more aware of it. You know, uh, I think more than anything, I don't purposely go out of my way to to be there for others and to help I just think naturally I feel like I should be there and and I and I sometimes I really do and uh, but sometimes it jeopardizes uh, other commitments but but yeah I, I just love helping others out uh, there's like a deep kind of inner happiness and and glow yes. that I get from going out of my way to to be here to help a friend a colleague um, sometimes my wife will probably say I, I, you know, do it too much, right? Uh, stretch myself too thin, but, but hey, it's naturally who I am. Well, I, I see it. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Appreciate and, that. um, you know, I've asked you for several things along the way and, and you've always been there. So I, I <laughs> just, I'm so glad you're here because, um, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for a while. So it's, Thank it's you. very special to have you I'm with me. Happy to be here. So you are, in my opinion, an ultimate creative, um, and you live your life creatively in a lot of different ways, at least from what I know. Of course, I'm not with you every day. I don't <laughs> know you intimately, but from what I see, what do you think has been like the inspiration behind that for you? And I'll also say that the word creative has kind of this connotation that either you're in film, you're a photographer, or you're an art director who knows how to do Photoshop, right? But I've always had this mantra where, you know, anyone could be creative, right? The word creative isn't just assigned to someone. It could be anyone who just thinks of things differently, right? So, so wanted to preface with that. But yeah, I think my creativity just kind of sprung from from looking at things and thinking hey i wonder if we could try to do it this way you know or has anyone looked at this in a you know opposite way right i think and it really probably started as you know we'll get into it but my career in creative advertising right advertising agencies that's where i started in my professional career i think that's a lot of what those those uh, agencies and companies do is is constantly look at a, a business challenge a client 
problem and think, okay, how can we solve it in an unexpected way, in a way that people wouldn't really think? And and that's why I'll say again, creativity can be applied to anything. Could be how you set up a podcast. How can you, you know, hang a microphone from the top or do just do things like differently, right? I think that's yeah. that's what I like. And it's just naturally in me of always thinking of, hey, there there's many ways to do things and and uh, you know, maybe think differently for once. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Do you think that there's like an innate curiosity like is that something have you been a curious person always or is it problem solving i mean at the root of it like when you were younger and we're going to talk about like mm-hmm. your because you had a unique childhood yes as we all have but yours has been <laughs> i think did you always try to f- fix things or solve things or were you curious or I would maybe say it's more on the curiosity standpoint yeah. and and funny enough growing up curious George right yeah. is kind of a thing I, I believed in myself but but I, it, it morphs I don't think it's a hundred percent that I'm just a very naturally curious person I just think I, I have this lens in my life that I, I you know I'd see it like sunglasses right you could just take them off and on on and off and I just always have this this creative lens where if I see something I, I can picture that differently or picture it somewhere else or or and maybe it is tied exactly to to where we're going which which is my my childhood where I was bouncing around different countries and I just saw how you know you can be in Latin America and hear five six different Spanish dialects right it's all Spanish right, right? but everyone speaks it differently and that just kind of early on in my childhood made me realize hey it's all spanish but it's it's differently right so within one object one thing there's many lens to it you know what was that like so i know you were you were originally born in el, el paso. paso yep yep but then moved somewhere in the what fifth grade uh, it was third grade third grade i'll tell the quick story carrie because yeah. it's hilarious my dad uh came <laughs> home from work one day with a shirt for me and my old two older sisters and it was a shirt that looked like the texas flag right and we were just like why is our dad giving us a shirt of the texas flag we're in el paso we know the texas flag why is it and he's like no 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 like turn it sideways look at it differently right and we're like what is this and then oh uh, that time we didn't have google right uh but he had to explain that's not the texas flag that's the flag of chile the country oh, wow. of chile so for those of you listening and haven't ever compared the state flag of texas is almost identical yeah. to the country flag of chile so that was his way of telling us hey we're all moving in the middle of the third grade to to the country of chile and we moved to uh, santiago Wow. which is the capital of, of Chile. And, and yeah, it was rough. I'll admit that I was still younger than my sister. So I think for my sisters, it was it was a little harder for them to, you know, leave their friends, their their roots in El Paso. You know, I, of course, had friends and stuff, but I was a young one just ready for the ride, right? But uh, it was definitely harder on my sisters because they had to break up with friends or, or do the long distancing with friends. And I think, you know, I, I always look back and said, well, you know, I'm I'm ready for the journey, um, but but for me it wasn't necessarily hard because I was still young, and then I just got used to it um, to to go into it. We lived in Santiago, Chile for about six months, then we went to Bogota, Colombia. We lived in two years for Colombia. That's a whole other story of, of of that country, beautiful country, but but some definite uh, you know security issues and and things with with violence. But from there we went to Argentina, which I loved, Buenos Aires. And then before we made it back to the U.S., we actually lived in Monterey, Mexico. Wow. So, yeah, uh, three countries in South America, one in Mexico, one city in in Mexico and Monterey. And I just got used to it. For me, it was common practice to make friends, have a life, and then a year, year or two later, just pack up things and go on to the next one. And I think I I probably reflect now that's, that's probably where a lot of my personality comes from. Right. Uh, and I appreciate all, all the nice things you've said. I think my personality is just that where I, I can go to any room, any place and just talk to anyone because I had to do that. I was forced into that in a way. Right. When you're in the fourth and fifth grade and you're told to ne- move to the next country, you just have to kind of be the new kid again and and get picked on a little bit. But then you make friends. Right. And that's why I'm so extroverted. And, and, and I consider myself outgoing is just because I had to do more for myself. Right. Multiple times and just do it all over again. And, and that's so that I look at the positive side of that and, and it's made me who I am. Yeah. What do you think that you picked up? like culturally from each because these are very different lifestyles well culturally i'll say i mentioned the language piece earlier how every country had a differently food 
was different, uh, a lot of colloquialisms. And, and I think what, what I, a lot of what I picked up learnings is just trying to find ways to assimilate mm. and, and to fit in without, you know, trying too hard, right? And, and, when, and you and I are big believers in culture, right? And, and what it means and it's the, you know, red line of society, right? I think you look at all these countries that I lived in and you look at their different cultures and it's so unique and it's good to appreciate and you quickly have to understand it and then just try to be it, you know? Right. A perfect example is, is soccer, right? And, and I'm a huge soccer fan, huge, huge, huge. Been to two World Cups, um, started watching soccer when I was a kid with my grandpa uh, in El Paso. And I think the tie there is every country that I lived in, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, huge, passionate fans of soccer, right? And I basically would go to each country and be like, okay, who's the cool team? Who, who is everyone cheering for? All right, I'm going to cheer for that team just so that I can assimilate and, and be in the same with everyone, right? And I think that was my way. Culture was the connecting point, right? Uh, or soccer, sorry, was the connecting point to, to culture. But essentially, I was living and breathing, go to the stadiums, wear the same uh, soccer shirts that my friends would wear. And that was my way of trying to, to fit in and just take in the culture and be the culture there. It's so interesting because you think about like people watching what you're doing mm -hmm. or, or, and, and or actually we don't think about it on a regular basis, but yeah. like how much our kids are picking up on the things that we're doing. Yep. But when you're forced mm -hmm. to move around and you're more aware of what you're doing, you yep. probably notice that, you know, the impression that, that is put upon you all oh, yeah. the time. I think that's why, you know, well, and things are getting better now in terms of traveling, but I'm a huge proponent of traveling. And, you know, I've, I've never blinked once when it comes to, you know, sometimes the high expenses of traveling, uh, just because I feel like it's necessary. It's yeah. almost upon us as humans to just be mm -hmm. in an uncomfortable setting, be somewhere where you don't know the language and you have no idea how the culture works, because that's how we learn about others. And that's how we learn about ourselves, right? You can really tell a lot about someone when they're in an uncomfortable situation, let alone a country where I've been, for example, like Russia, where I was close to, uh, for one of the World Cup experiences, close to basically Kazakhstan and, and people barely spoke English. Uh, luckily, Google now existed, right? So we were able to Google Translate a lot. But yeah, or just show me your just phone. show the taxi guy because <laughs> I would wrongfully assume the guy would be able to speak English. Nope, we had to Google Translate and show our phones and say, wow. "Hey, this is what we're trying to say. This is where we're trying to go." So yeah, I, I'm a huge believer in travel, but just in general, when you're put in uncomfortable situations and new scenarios, new areas, that's where you learn a lot about others and and yourself. Do you think that ultimately, having lived in all of these places, has really helped your career oh completely right oh yeah. i would think that it would be like a huge benefit mm -hmm. to you because you see things from so many perspectives oh yeah yeah every person i've met along my my career short career so far but uh i i if i met meet someone who's from colombia i'll be like oh in spanish i'll be like oh you're from colombia i live there and we'll talk about restaurants we'll talk about the the soccer piece we'll talk about you know potential schools and universities and i think that's always a quick way for me to especially with a stranger just build a bridge right, right. and 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 to your first question is it intentional or not sometimes it's not intentional i'm just naturally like oh hey you're from colombia where oh yeah i went to that city i went to medellin i went to arranquilla when i lived in colombia and then they'll naturally ask me oh you lived in colombia when how when and there it just opens up the conversation after that the doors you know? box mm -hmm. there you go <laughs> um I see that you have like a natural interest in people. Mm -hmm. I think that that's another probably huge benefit when you're talking because advertising, advertising yeah. and, is and marketing people. is people, yes, right? Yes. Um, do they always fascinate you, or do you do you relate that to assimilation? To what are your thoughts on that? It's not necessarily that that certain people fascinate me. What what I really have a huge intrigue on is how people react to other people. Ah. You know what I mean? So imagine a, a conference room setting, right? Of course, whatever the business meeting or, or whatever is being discussed is important. And I'm trying to pay attention to that, of course. It's my job. But I will be kind of seeing nonverbal cues, right? Yeah. I'll be looking at, you know, hey, was was the person presenting said something that might have, you know, offended someone or caused a reaction on someone. You could easily tell, right? anywhere from how they move on the chair or or the classic you know people are not paying attention or on their phone you know in the middle of a meeting or on their computer you just those are the obvious ones right 
but I could roll out a Rolodex of, you know, 50 others that I just, you know, not that I'm actively looking for, right? That's the, I'm trying to pay attention to the meaning, but I could just easily sense, right? Like being corny, it's like a spidey sense. I could sure. just sometimes sense, you know, like someone's not, you know, comfortable or is not liking the direction. And and it's helped me well for my career for for most instances, right? Where if if I if I'm presenting something and I read the room, right? They talked mm-hmm. about reading the room. Mm-hmm. I really took that to heart because I could tell as I'm going slide five, six, seven, eight. If I see and feel more than anything, feel that people are lost, I'll always be the first one to be like, okay, do, do you need me to take a step back? Are any questions like can't do do you do you need to clarify something? I think that's one of my strong suits and and attributes is just trying to really sense people, right? Yeah. Um, because it, it's not easy to, but I think it's it's helps me a lot in the future to be able to tell you know what I'm sensing something's a little off. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that on some level that would maybe be called empathy. Yes, great way. Yep, having empathy for others and feeling them yep. and. And making sure that you sense where they are. When did you know that you wanted to be in this creative advertising and marketing field? Like, uh, I'll tell you also that not a lot of people know this, but at, at one point I wanted to be a lawyer, but but not because I necessarily like books and structure and law or and fighting with people and probably. fighting with people. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a confrontationalist. I'll, I can tell you that. No, I there was a movie. Uh, not to date myself, but maybe you guys have, have heard of this one. Um, it's with uh, Tom Cruise, uh-huh. uh, and it's with Jack Nicholson, and it's a law movie. Uh, I'm f- forgetting the name. A Few Good Men. Yes. If, if you've seen it, there's yes. an iconic scene where Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson are going at it, and it's still brought up a lot, right? Did you order the code red? And Jack goes, ah, you're damn right I ordered the code red, right? And it's this whole debacle, but it was the entertainment, the showmanship. Yeah. And at one point I was like, man, I want to be not necessarily Tom Cruise, right? But I just want to be in a courtroom, you know, have the spotlight and just be able to persuade, right? That was kind of the beginning. I realized how much work law school is and not to say business school is, is any much easier, but uh, the, from there, more, more, more into creativity and pitches and persuasive presentations. And I would say at the time I was finishing my undergraduate degree in business, I was uh, really into Mad Men, uh, yeah. the show yep. uh, on AMC that was popular for a while, uh, Don Draper, right? And everyone uh, that I knew in my circle was loving the show and just wanted to be Don, Don Draper, right? Let alone the, you know, James Bond, you know, yeah. female stuff. More so just at any given time, he could go into a room and, and empathy, he would use empathy and he would just go deep and just be able to, you know, sell whatever it is he was selling, right? Could have been, well, at that time, cigarettes, maybe not the best product to be uh, persuading on, but you get me, right? And I think yeah. that was where I really got inspired from seeing others, seeing the the leadership in the room, the the persuasive skills. And that's, I was like, you know what? I want to do that. I want to be a creative guy. I want to be in those rooms and I want to be able to convince people uh, to to feel, right? To, to have the the desire to want something that maybe they didn't want in the in the first part, you know? But yeah, I think the agency stuff was great. But then I, after six years or so, I said, all right, well, what's my next move? Where, where am I going next? And I realized that on the agency side, you're a little limited ultimately into what the client wants, right? right? You know, we could, right. there are so many times. And, it's a and limiting, it's a limiting your creativity a little it, bit. It is, because, it is. And yeah. you can have, I still, uh, I'm a huge proponent and, and my, my current boss says this all the time too. There's awesome creativity that can come within constraints, right? So you should never feel like if you're in a sandbox that you can't really do awesome creativity, but Generally speaking, at an agency, you know, you work months and months on a project, work months and months on a campaign, you know it's great, you know it's going to be a hit, and then ultimately it's it's the disposal of the client. They might say, you know what, we don't have money for that anymore. Thank you, but no thank you. Or after two, three layers of selling up an idea all the way up up the chain and it gets to the sea level and then that person's like, you know what, I don't understand it. I don't believe in it. And you're just like, so then that's it? That That's over? That that little creative campaign that we've been working on for months, it's just gone. And yeah, and it, from one day to the next, it could just be, you know, put to the side. And then, you know, it's disappointing and it's oh, it's de- uh, defeating for sure. And, and there's more of the traditional creative guys at agencies who take it really hard, right? One, one creative director I worked with once said, described his creative ideas to be almost akin to a baby, right? right? And he's like, Jorge, imagine when I'm, 
presenting ideas to the client, I'm putting my baby out there, mm. right? And when the client doesn't like it or critiques it, it's like you're hitting my baby, right? And I'm like, okay, well, that's a little exaggerated, right? But but I could see it, right? What he's meaning, and that's that's where that was a pivotal point for me to be like, you know what? I I, I love this agency part. I love the creativity, the business of selling ideas, but but there's limitations, and and I want to now be on the decision-making side, right? Uh, and that's where I've been the past five years now working in two different companies, uh, Anheuser-Busch, uh, the beer company that I once did an internship for, right? But now doing it on the corporate marketing side. Uh, and then now currently with Avocados from Mexico where, yeah, it's, it's hey, business of, of buying ideas and selling it internally, right? Which ideas will get our brands talked about? And it's so fun, it's creative, and uh, it's intense, but but uh, that's that's where I'm at now. What do you think is uniquely special about avocados? Because there's something that seems really unique in that culture that you're in right now that I want to grab a hold of yeah. from you. Well, there's two things. One, from a culture perspective, it's the reality that even growing up in El Paso, which is still Texas, but, but Mexican families, um, the avocado is just always there. Right. It's, a, it's a staple. It's not something you get introduced later in life, like I've seen with some of my uh, American friends here. Right. Um, no, it's probably it's, your first baby food It there. could be, yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't yeah. even remember, but you see it early on and breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the avocado's always there. So, so that's the first piece, because here, and a lot of the research that we do, or just anecdotally talking to my friends, people didn't know avocados until later in their life. Or they're like, uh, we did some research once, so they're like, oh yeah, we've ne I've never had avocados, but I've had guacamole. And we're like, that's the same. Thing. But anyways, the point is, is that, yes, there's a cultural thing there where it's it's now becoming a trend and it's great, but it's and it's becoming a thing in babies' lives now in the U.S., but it wasn't in, in Mexico. It's always been part of our lives. So that's one thing. But specifically about the product itself, I think what, what's so great, it's a fruit because avocados have a seed. In some case, people are listening. It's like, okay, didn't know that. Avocado is a fruit. Uh, it's part of the, the berry family with the seed. But the, the uniqueness about the avocado is that it's kind of a trifecta. And our CEO talks about this all the time. It's a trifecta that it's a delicious product, right? It's, it's a delicious piece of food, right? Two, it's healthy, right? Uh, it's, it's got good fats. There's a difference between good and bad fats, right? We have the good ones. Uh, and then ultimately it's just trendy. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we've done some research on this, but could have been truly just a, a, uh, avocado toast phenomenon in Brooklyn where one restaurant, you know, put it on their menu, put some avocado on a bread, obviously priced it a little higher. And, and then it just became an Instagram uh, piece, right? And the avocado toast is now a staple on a lot of brunch menus in Dallas, across California. And, and you know, we would like to say that it's because of our company and our marketing, but it just kind of happened naturally. So that's why avocados are that trifecta of delicious, good for you, right? And then also trendy. Um, so that's that's what's unique about it. That is super unique. And it would, what's nice is that on some level, you get to kind of inform people. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about tricking the <laughs> brain. I, I hate to say that. That's what came to my mind. Or like marketing to the brain. Mm -hmm. Like there's this educational yep. facet to it, which maybe makes it feel a little bit easier to, I don't know, to like, get, I don't know, to get creative with on some level. Mm -hmm. um, but it is interesting because you're right. Like there's hardly a restaurant anymore that you go into that doesn't have avocado mm -hmm. toast anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it is literally like, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. And I remember my brother's a big traveler. Um, he's lived in a lot of different places. He speaks Spanish. He taught himself Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, he's now living in New York. But I can't remember where he had traveled to, but he came home and he said, what's, he said, it's, it's the culture is amazing. He says, I mean, in that culture, they literally take avocado and they slap it on and they eat it for breakfast. They slap it on a mm -hmm. piece of toast. And this was like 20 years ago. Yep. He was telling me about it. I was like, really? Cause we were just mm -hmm. discovering avocado at this time. It's, like, it's amazing. It's so delicious, but it's so interesting to see mm -hmm. this, this thing happening. I mean, my daughter, who's at 17, going on 18 years old, that's the first thing she looks for on the menu. Nice. So talk about trendy. Yeah. I mean, you know, these 
kids. That's all they care about is keeping mm-hmm. up with the trends. But she can't wait to have the avocado toast at every single restaurant. <laughs> so, well, and and that's yes, we we have a job to kind of educate a little bit because it's more than just the avocado toast, right? right. You can put it in on a salad. You can make it for guac and put guac on a burger, on a taco, whatever it is. So there's a lot of versatility in the avocado, and it's kind of our job to to inform people of that, right? And you've created a restaurant concept, right? Correct. That's our, the, yep. our, little, yes, our, little sideline a gig. A little sideline gig, <laughs> our, our, and that's all kudos to our food service team. Yes, here at Trinity Groves, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we launched a, a concept called Avo Eatery. Yeah. And it's a menu, 39 pieces, I believe, on the menu, and all have avocados. So the world's first avocado-only restaurant, polished avocado restaurant. Um, and uh, it's it's great. And yeah, you can go there and get inspired. And I think that's the other thing right. I was going to say. Avocados, You, we are in a job of just making people think differently of how you can use an avocado. Mm-hmm. And either through video content, through influencer posts, through website material, we always just try to just inspire people uh, with recipes and get them thinking, oh, hey, I can do this. And maybe I just found out about what the avocado toast is, but I'm going to start now doing it at home regularly, you know? So tell your daughter, thank you for always thinking about avocados and consuming. Yeah. Uh, our and take her fruit. to the restaurant, right? Yes, so yes, that inspired. too. <laughs> um, how is your job, your career? It's mm-hmm. not a job. Because you have just graduated from SMU Business School, yes. which I want to get into as well, yes. which is a beautiful accomplishment as you're working and as you have a wife, a beautiful wife at home and all these other things that you're into, which we haven't even touched. But um, how has the role in marketing changed with social media? Because mm-hmm. like you said, when you first got into the business and in the advertising space, that probably wasn't as much mm-hmm. your role. And now it's the significant part of what you do. How's that? Talk about it's, it's that. It's exploded, yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny because for a long time, you know, I remember an undergrad, I orientation day, I was signing up for my .edu address and that was when I could join the Facebook. It wasn't called Facebook then. It was called the Facebook. And you could only join because you had a .edu address, right? And that's how it started, right? Harvard and, and uh, such as you had to have a .edu address. So I remember signing it up, thinking this is so cool, getting my profile set up. MySpace was long gone be- behind the, the rear view mirror and, you know, it was so cool. And for a long time, social media was was cool. I'm not saying it's not cool anymore, but now it's become my job, right? Because right. it's just exploded and there's so much uh, opportunity to, to persuade uh, customers, to inform consumers, to inspire consumers. And it's, it's become a good component because that's, that's uh, probably nowadays, there's so many more ways to reach people, especially younger audiences right. through social media than through traditional TV, right? There's the concept of cord cutting where people are no longer uh, paying for you know traditional TV Mm-mm. or are going straight to a Hulu device or a smart TV. So there's no more that traditional angle, right? But more than anything is social media is now maybe the first touch point for some brands, right? Yeah. And we're lucky, and, and as we've discussed already, avocados are kind of trendy. So my job's a little easier because to get people to talk about avocados on social media, it's it's truly not that hard. So so it's it's one of those where you know some of our strategy sometimes is just user generated content. Mm. You know, people like your daughter, right? Posting on a Saturday morning with in front of their porch, you know, having an avocado toast, and and usually that picture, especially now how iPhones are, that picture looks awesome, right. and we'll literally straight up ask people like your daughter and be like, hey, do you mind if we use that picture? And nine times out of ten, carry they're like, sure. And, right. and no cost. You're like, yes, I get to get featured on Avocados from Mexico's Instagram page with 50,000 followers. Sure, yeah, use it. And that's great. That's the beauty of it, right? But I think so social media has made marketing have to adjust itself, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, be younger and just think about technology. And there's always the next one, right? And, and uh, we've talked about this previously, but the growth of like TikTok, that one's just another one that hit right at the beginning of the pandemic where – you know, yes, it was an app more for uh, younger audience dancing and doing that type of stuff. But when everyone was at home, instead of maybe watching a TV show on Netflix, they were consuming not just five minutes of TikTok, not just 20 minutes. I mean, some of their average times are in the 30 minutes. People are 30 minutes on one app, right? Where Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, it's a quick in and out check. Whose birthday is it on Facebook? Okay. Who, on Instagram, whose awesome picture from Maui? Uh, who got married now? Great. Twitter, okay. Who's yelling at who now about the state of the country, right? It's kind of like in and out, in and out. 
while while TikTok is immersive entertainment, sound, you know, 60 seconds, but it's just funny content. And especially in the pandemic, when we were all stuck in our couches, right. we needed this humor of, hey, we're all in this together. I'm, you know, trying, I'm here with my dog that I just got, and it's so funny, his faces or whatever, and I'll make a TikTok about that, and that's entertaining. So long story uh, or long answer, but social media has just revolutionized marketing for the better and just made it uh, have to have more of an emphasis on what's trending, what are people on, what do people want to be entertained with, and, and it's on marketers now to figure that out and be ahead of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and not just be responsive. Oh, you know, there's a lot of brands that got ahead of it on TikTok, and now there's some of the most popular and, and trendy ones. And one of them is actually has to do a little bit with avocados. It's Chipotle. Chipotle has a huge following and audience and love their food, love their product. And yeah, they're, they're one of the first to, to be on TikTok. Huge followership people love. And and it's not that people wake up in the morning and be like, hey, I wonder what Chipotle is doing on TikTok. More than anything, they follow the account. And then any content that Chipotle pushes out, people will see it. And it's usually something about, you know, the burrito or guac is extra. But but it's, it's in t- reminding them about the brand forming a relationship with the brand. And then if they're hungry in a couple hours, they might be thinking, oh, that's hey, they're going. I'm going to go there. You know what I mean? It, it, it <laughs> oh. sounds simple, but that's that's kind of how no, it works. I see it in my house all the time because I have a lot of children and they're they're older children. My, my youngest is just about to be 15. So these aren't like babies. Uh-huh. Um, so they're all on TikTok. And I can't tell you how many trends. My daughter's mm-hmm. made a million different recipes or my son has a million different political views or, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, the influence. It's actually a little terrifying as a yeah. parent because you're like, what are you watching? But as a brand, I would think that it would be amazing, but also very a lot of pressure to and, try and, and intimidating. Keep up, yeah, right? Yes, completely. So what would you say? Like I don't want to get too much into like advice. This isn't the Jorge gives us advice show. <laughs> but what would you say to those of us that are not, you know, uh, doing this on a daily basis are some general principles to kind of look for in social media right now? What well, should we pay attention to or what what should we give us a couple of what we should do? What sh- you should do. So another big thing going on with social media is how quickly it's connecting to e-commerce or mm-hmm. sale, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram's getting there, but now you can see a beautiful picture of of a dress or a shoe, and without having to go anywhere else, you can tap on it, and and it tells you how much it costs, and then you click on a link, and you're already got it in your cart, ready to shop it's out, crazy. right? And that's just crazy, right? Think about it before how it used to be. You had to go to a brick and mortar store or you had to go to a website, fill in all this info on your desktop and it was clunky. Now it's quick touch to shop, right? And Amazon does this well too as well. That's not social media related, but Amazon's just great at just making the checkout process a little too just easy. Too, too easy. easy, right? My wife and I just make, I've talked about this, yeah. it makes it too easy. But anyway, I don't want to use you, yes, I don't want to yeah, use they you. make the swipe out, it's too easy. But anyways, back to social media, I think e-commerce is huge. And there's a whole section actually of TikTok uh, and it's a hashtag that's usually trending that it's, things I've bought on TikTok oh. because just people <laughs> see something on TikTok, buy it, then t- post about it and show a video. And it just, and, and I read a stat at one point that like almost 50% of products marketed on TikTok get purchased. And that's just mind blowing, right? Because if you're a brand, you're a marketer, big or small, you're thinking that means if I'm on TikTok and I have two followers, one of those is going to buy. That's, that's almost, you know, ensuring a sale, which is, which is crazy. So I think e-commerce is something to always be thinking about if you're Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of brands are just not even doing, you know, big campaign launches when they start, or if they're a new uh, product, they go direct to consumer, right? And all they need is, well, of course, a website, but then they need a social channel to just get their product out there. No, no, have to pay retail uh, leasing on any office because they can just literally sell directly to consumers mm-hmm. on social media. So that's one big thing. Uh, another thing that's so important on on uh, in terms of just social media in general is how each channel is very different, right? And as a marketer, or if you're even thinking about marketing yourself, you have to think about the strengths of each channel and basically have a strategy for each channel, which is, I know, a lot to take in, right? But uh, we've we've operated on this as a company, but just in general, I've always thought about it in this lens where you can't have a social media strategy where essentially every piece of content that you have is going to look the same across all channels, right? You have to be thinking about 
cutting things differently or approaching uh-huh. things differently. And even the verbiage is different, right? What you see on Twitter, the way people in you know 260 characters little talk, bits, yeah. the little bits talk differently than what you see on Facebook, which sometimes you see you know longer posts and and people are are gonna maybe see longer form video on Facebook. You can maybe hit someone with a two three minute piece of uh, content on Facebook, but that's not gonna be what you see on TikTok because that's a 60 second limitation. And then you probably shouldn't use that long video on Twitter too because people are just going up and down their Twitter feed, right? So every channel has their own, and then of course Instagram is the holy grail of beautiful pictures, right? And I think that's the other thing too, is is you almost have to like shoot photography thinking about the beauty and, and what's showcased on Instagram since it's a little more vain, but but people definitely put a little extra effort on their pictures on Instagram because it's almost like a museum, you know? Ah. So so something to take away there, you know, a little free advice is just really have a strategy advice. for each channel. It's a lot to take in. Uh, and the last point I'll say is I was one of those people who did not want to be on TikTok. And I was like, no, that's a Vine knockoff. Are you guys remember Vine? Totally. Yep. Uh, uh, social media killed that one off a, a long time ago. But the point is, is TikTok became a short little piece of video. And I was like, yeah, no, it's just people dancing. Not my thing. But like I said, I referenced uh, early last 2020, right? When, when everyone was stuck at home. I was like, okay, well, if I'm in marketing, I feel like I should know what TikTok is. Let me get on it, right? And now I, I will gladly admit there's you know a couple times a week where I'll get on it and, and I, again, I'll get on it for a couple of minutes. I'll get on it for a while just because there's some great content. I'll be sharing links to my friends, sharing stuff to my, to my wife and be like, oh my God, you have to watch this TikTok. It's so funny, right? Uh, and she still doesn't have it. But uh, it's but, and that's fine. But the point is, is that I was first kind of intimidated by it and then I got on it and now... It's great and, and I learn a lot and I see trends and, and there's always ways where if you see what's going on in a world like TikTok or other social media channels, you can proactively or better word, preemptively prepare content, right? Yeah. Um, as things are starting to become viral, you can kind of get ahead of it and say, oh, I say, you know, people at, at home are really getting into cooking right? Because they're at home and stuck for a period of time. Let's get ahead of it and give them recipes about what you can cook at home with the recipes or with ingredients that you have at home, right? And so you can kind of start preemptively preparing. And it's a lot of social media should not be reactionary. It should be proactive, right? And everything that you put out there is before the consumer even thinks about it instead of just reacting to to what's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's... um it's a whole kind of world. Whole world, yes. I, I said to my daughter, which it exists because I looked it up, but I thought that I had this brilliant idea the other day. Um, I think thinking about you and preparing for the fact that you were going to be here, and I was like, this is what I need. I need a social media coach. Like, <laughs> that's what I need. And, yep. and I, I had this whole concept, which, by the way, completely exists, but I didn't realize it because that's how far be- behind the eight ball <laughs> I am. But, like, I was like, I actually need somebody to, like, walk me through it and Mm -hmm. teach it to me, ask me the right questions and let me answer them and then show me how to prepare content. And that's what I need. And, but it's, you know, some of us can figure it out and some of us just can't. And I think it's going to take me a little longer than, (laughs) than those. But I will say on that TikTok, my husband, who by the way is not 15 (laughs) (laughs) and he's definitely not who you would think would be on TikTok there's hardly a day that he doesn't send me something. Okay, so he's on he it. He's just, addicted. He just got into it and he's yes. in construction. He's a builder. Yeah. And there's this builder that does yeah. all these different TikToks and he's fascinated by it. But of course, it takes you into all these other things. So every single day, oh, yeah. Neil sends me some sort of TikTok like you are doing to your wife. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so you're, yeah, you're 100%. It's it's caught on. It is yes. definitely caught on, even for, the, for those of us that are dinosaurs. <laughs> um, I want to hear about um, you know, culture in your own life, Mm -hmm. because beyond just being this master creator and creating for other people, um, you seem to live a life with a lot of intentionality. And we talked about that in the beginning. Um, you're involved in a lot of things. You've started a lot of different organizations Mm -hmm. and really cultural type of organizations. I know you have a ministry that Mm -hmm. you're involved in, right? I know that you've got this ad advertising, uh, mission with with younger advertisers mm-hmm. and, and a collective group. So obviously, like pulling people together and creating cultural. Exp- I know you're involved in the cultural experience in your own company. Oh yeah. So what is what is that for you? Why? And I think it ties to one of the first things we talked about. I, I'm just very 
focused in on how people feel, mm-hmm. right? So to me, for example, it, it matters a lot how in this inter- interaction, how you're feeling, how you're responding. And I always want to make sure you're comfortable. And if I'm hosting, my wife and I are hosting friends or at a house or, you know, party or whatever, we're always just, we're very focused in on, we want to make sure you're having the best time that you can possibly have uh, in that current time, right? And I think that applies to all those things you just mentioned. Could be, you know, yes, uh, ministries through through uh, my church or could be with my company, right? I'm constantly thinking, hey, yes, we came here to market avocados, to do some campaigns and it's a lot of work and, and it's fun and all, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure that everyone's still doing what they're doing and, and, and enjoying it, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing like working with a colleague who who's maybe checked out Right. Or who doesn't like what they're doing. And that, you know, sadly enough, happens a lot. Right. Totally. And and I'm not HR. Right. It's not my job to, to, you know, to maybe fix some of that. It's it's my job. And yes, I'm part of our culture committee at, at Avocados of Mexico. And it's my job to make sure, hey, how can we get you more engaged? Hey, let's, you know, especially during the pandemic, back to that, you know, we were kind of all locked in working from home, long hours, a lot of Zoom meetings. And I was one of the first ones to raise my hand and said, hey, I know this is going to be a little awkward, but let's just do a happy hour. Mm-hmm. virtually all from a comfort of our home offices and not a breakthrough idea and your idea kind of cl- you know yeah yes kind of caught on yeah and it, and it became a thing well <laughs> and we were one of the first to just host a happy hour and then of course it changed it to, okay we're virtually gonna call in but now let's do some games one time we were playing bingo virtually and i was the one leading it because it's just my personality you know me now and it just came natural to be like, all right, bingo, who has got number two on their card? And we figured out a way to mail people their cards safely and we played bingo, right? And it, that's simple little things, but we were doing virtually. And I think, you know, my organization, they, they told me this recently now that we're starting to go back that they really appreciated that during the, the crisis era time that we were, I kind of stepped up as our unofficial MC of fun times, right? right. And uh, every and held little, it together. Yep, yep. Because I, I felt it important, right? Even though we were having a lot of calls and still making doing the work that we needed to do to move our business forward, I felt it upon myself to make sure that people still feel connected to the organization that that they still clicked with us, right? And and I think you know, again, HR, I worked side by side with them on that, and and that's more in their territory. But yeah, this fun uh, times committee that we had was all about just making sure people still connected to who we are and this this feeling of, of fun times, of vibrancy, right? Even though we were all kind of locked in, right? So I'm, now that we're coming back into the office, it's much more optimism, and now. You know, we're going to go back to, to you know, going to Top Golf and having outings and, you know, because it's more so about just getting out there, right? I think mm-hmm. it's really hard to build a, a company culture. Our CEO says this all the time, virtually, right? right? So now that we're coming back in, let's continue to build on that culture and let's do outings. Let's do celebrate, you know, monthly breakfast. If someone has a birthday, I know it's corny, but let's all get into the break room and, you know, sing a little happy birthday and have a little cake. I mean... Why not, right? Those are all traditions for a good reason. And those are all little examples of things we're doing to make sure that the culture is still there and that it and it continues to keep people engaged. Because again, you'll see in those interactions where little side conversations are happening. Oh, hey, did you just have a house? Oh, great, I didn't know that. Or hey, you're the new guy, right? We hired you during COVID. We didn't actually meet you. Nice right. to meet you, Nick, right? And things like that happen when people are put into these scenarios, right? Where a lot of times companies just kind of focus on you work. know, work, 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 but they're not doing an extra effort to have these interactions, to have the little celebrations, the uh, office outings outside of the office, because it kind of breaks the the mold there and people aren't, you know, they're, they're a little more relaxed and free and you, drinks can or cannot be involved. But I think that's where the real culture of the company's felt is when you transport people outside of the office and they're hanging out and having a good time, you know? I think like ultimately it's, it's honoring the whole person mm-hmm. and not just the part of them that they're there to serve if you will exactly um and i would bet in a culture like that or with a personality like yours that you inevitably pull out more creativity from people because guess what when you feel good Mm -hmm. and you're being you know fed in the all in all arenas of your life um your response is that you are inevitably more creative and more mm-hmm. enlightened and and so i think it's a it's so valuable um i love that and and you're right when it's really hard to be creative when you're so focused on the work and you're so stressed and you're so into something right that you don't let these new ideas come come to your head and they don't let and you also don't let time 
sit with them, right? Because mm -hmm. if there's anything to take out of this, I'll, I'll give you what I believe is like an equation to creativity. It's not anything too breakthrough. It's that I believe that to get true, genuine ideas, you, it, it, they might spark up to you at one point, but they're going to morph, right? So the key component of creativity is having the idea, parking it, setting it there, and then, and then get busy, do something else, and then come back to it, and then build on it and then keep it there parked. And then maybe someone closer, a personal or a coach come in and ha talk about it, see how they react to it, see if you can add a little bit and mold it. And you start kind of building more to her and it starts, exp you know, expanding, right? But but I think I've always been the one who's like, oh, you, I can come up with any idea now and here you go. And it's like, well, wait, time is one of the key important ingredients of, of creativity because mm -hmm. you have to kind of put it there. And it's almost like looking at a, you know, painting in a museum, right? It's up there. You look at it quickly, you walk by it, but then you kind of walk back and then you look at it again and you're like, oh, I didn't see that. Or, and then you kind of take a step back and you're like, well, well, now I can see that. And then you leave to go to the bathroom and then you come back and you're like, well, wait, the artist was really trying to do this. And then, so you start piecing things together, right? That's an analogy just in art, but, and creativity in a way is art, right? But that's, if there's any equation to take away for anyone listening is just, just have, if you have a really good idea, keep it to yourself but and keep it parked there and then little by little start building on it and then go for a walk and then come back to it, right? Because you're not going to have great breakthrough creativity if you're just constantly thinking about it and pushing you're stressed and you're it. pushing against it, right? And there is a, is a worry of you bring someone your baby, like the creative director was telling you your baby and they might want to change it or say, oh, that's a terrible idea. It's a stupid idea. And that does happen, but you have to kind of protect it. That's why you have to kind of, you know, keep it to yourself. And when you do bring people in, it has to be people who who will who will give you the confidence that you're onto something. They might not agree with it, but they're never gonna squash your idea. Right. right? And they shouldn't, right? So I think anyways, that's my little spiel on, on time that. and creativity. I love that. I, and I think that it gives everybody, those of us that maybe don't live as creative a life as we want to, and I told you that's something I'm very, very mm -hmm. strongly working on. Um it gives us a little bit of um, sort of this place to, to not feel pressure mm -hmm. and not feel like we can't. Um, it gives me that feeling of, hey, you know, just again, I, I you know, there's that there's the book, you know, um, by uh, Julia Cameron, um, which I just put down. It was it was sitting here that my um, sister keeps telling me to read called The Artist Way. OK. okay. And it's essentially about the practice of creativity and that it is a practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for people like me who I really want to be a creative and I think at heart am very much a creative, like, or I wouldn't be doing the mm -hmm. certain things that mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. do, but I always find myself back in, you know, go mode, which, you know, yep. in, in, in the real estate practice that I have and essentially in the property management, there's always, things to do and people to satisfy and, mm -hmm. and interruptions and constant interruptions. And when you let that interruption constantly be, it's very difficult to get to creativity. Oh yeah. And then you start to feel bad about yourself and you feel like you don't have it. And then, so you start and stop. And so I, I love the fact that you said, give it time. And it relates to that book again, because even if you just set a certain amount of time aside, mm -hmm an hour in the morning, 30 minutes in the morning, whatever, to allow yourself space to be creative yep. and chip away at it. I love the walking thing because I'm a big mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. exerciser and w I, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, but so I love that. I think that's amazing uh, to think of it that even the creatives mm -hmm. need the time. Yep. I love that. Let's talk about the running. The running. The yeah, running. My, my side gig and, and passion, yes. I love that. When did you discover that you were a runner? Probably not. Well, it was naturally instilled in, in me because of my father. So my father, prior to my sister's being born, he was a little overweight. Uh, he occasionally smoked and just didn't take care of himself, right? Yeah. A friend of his influenced him into getting into running when running wasn't even a thing. Not a lot of marathons existed at the time. And then he started running. Uh, and by the time I was born, he was already 
you know, a couple marathons in and my early childhood, if it was a vacation per se, it was, okay, where's dad's running his next marathon? It's Boston. It's San Francisco. Oh. Okay. We're going to go take a trip and visit that town while he, and we'll cheer him on while he's running the marathon. So that was, you know, we had other vacations too. We were a normal family too, but uh, th- that was a big component of us. And that's where I really started to see the the benefit and then the cool part of, yes, it's good for his health, but there's a whole community of runners who get together and challenge themselves to run these distances. Some you could argue are definitely a little crazier than others, uh, but it's it's not crazy. It's the body just challenging itself to, to do more and to accomplish more. So my dad was a huge component. And then right as I was graduating undergrad, uh, business school, I was in Austin. And I remember I told my dad, hey, dad, I want to run my first marathon. I said, okay, I'll, I'll run it with you. Let's do it. And he said, but it's going to require sacrifice. And I was like, oh, I got this, right? And it was it was a you know, challenge, right? When you're in college, the last thing you're wanting to do is go to sleep on a Friday night early so you can run 20 miles on a Saturday morning, right? At the time when most of your friends are getting ready to go out and hit the town or coming back from going out, all right? I was all, I was waking up to go run, and and it was a sacrifice. It was tough, uh, and yeah, I ran my first marathon uh, when I was barely twenty one. Amazing. And uh, it's been it's been a lot after that, but it's always just been a process of improvement, right? I ran my first one, uh, did a little over four hours, and I remember telling my dad, "Hey, this was so painful, but I can't wait to do it again." And then it's and he said, "All right, let's do Austin next next year again." You ran your first marathon in a li- wait, wait in four hours. Hold yes. up, <laughs> yes, yes. We just like skipped over that, like it was no big deal. Yep. Isn't that like an unbelievable time? Not, not entirely. <laughs> For my first time, it's it's not bad, right? Because after that, it just been okay. How can I do under four hours? Okay. Right. And then I started chipping every marathon after that. I started doing more. It was chipping ten minutes off you know, five minutes off and it's, that's harder to do. Right. Totally. And then a pivotal point in my life was probably around 2017 ish, uh, where I wanted to qualify for the Boston marathon, one of the most renowned marathons in the world. You have to qualify. So when it comes to your, your question earlier, like, wait, wasn't that time really good? Well, if you want to qualify for Boston, Boston, you have to have the best time that you could possibly have personal best. And at that time, the time was around three hours. So, in my span of, of running for less than 10 years, I had to go from a four hour marathon to a three hour marathon. And it took took many tries, took many years, but there's nothing like a feeling of accomplishing a goal, right? In this instance, I was able to run a marathon in California and run it at uh, right around three hours. And I was able to qualify. And when the Boston uh, committee emailed me and the marathon committee said, hey, congratulations, you can now register for the Boston Marathon. There's no better feeling than saying, wow, I accomplished this. I a lot of sweat and a lot of sweat and and some tears. There were some marathons where I was just right there on so close to the time, but didn't hit it right. And uh, yeah, that was a great challenge. And then it's so ironic how life is, Carrie, because after all these years of trying to qualify for Boston, I qualify. I'm so excited. I go out there to uh, uh, Hopkinton where they start the race, and it starts raining. Oh come on! And it's just one of those ironies in life where you just have to smile and laugh, right? Because I'm with the other runners, uh, all in similar age groups, and we've all worked hard to get here. And we're just there, just water pouring down, not not a little drizzle, no, like downpour, like torrential downpour. And we're just like, and you just have to laugh and be like, wow, how funny is this? We work so hard to get here. We're here, and it just poured, and it rained the whole 26 miles that I ran, all the way down to downtown uh, Boston. And of course, that that was brutal. Um, there was runners with hypothermia, uh, having to uh, not finish the race and get, you know, escorted out in an ambulance. It was that that dramatic, right? But, uh, you know, I finished fine. Everything was great. And, you know, and, and that was the other thing too. My uh, wife was out there, best friends were out there and they had signs with Jorge, <laughs> but they're all wet. They're all drenched. And I feel so bad for him. But, but uh, that's another thing where I put it into perspective, right? I'm out there running, getting wet, but then so are those people and they're doing it for me, right? So that just kind of oh. creates more fuel for me and more motivation for me to not stop, even though I'm, you know, got blisters on my feet because my socks keep on rubbing into my foot because of the rain, or um, my my gloves are just drenched. Uh, and and yeah, you but you again put it in perspective. These people are out here cheering for and and strangers too, right? The whole race, people are out there cheering you on, and that just puts it into perspective and humbles you a little bit. That if they're out there cheering you on. 
I should just I push forward. This. So yes, funny story, but finally ran Boston all in the rain. Oh my goodness, that's crazy. You're such an achiever. Where does that come from? I think it comes from examples of down of, the line. Down the line, my father, yeah, doing marathons. He was a businessman too in Mexico and here in the U.S. And just also my even my close friends. I have close friends that are also in two different uh, you know ventures and entrepreneurs. And I've seen them do things, and it kind of pushes us. It's a competitiveness, but a good one, right? Yeah. Um, and and if it could be running or just you know, uh, pushing ourselves to get a master's degree. You know, we're all there and, you know, one of our friends got it and they said, oh, well, that's when I was like, well, I got to get one too now, right? Uh, and then and then a third <laughs> friend is now, oh, hey, uh, guys, I just joined grad school too at TCU. Uh, and it's like, wow, okay. So it's just funny how we all just push ourselves. Yeah. And then, You're like, well, I'm graduating now. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I can say I'm a graduate too, but uh, that's it's a good thing. And I think that's why it's so important for people to have – you know, healthy uh, and, and inspirational examples in their close network, right? Absolutely. There's gr- the sum of the five people, and that's 100% true. Completely true, yeah. But it is interesting to to know somebody like you who's really an achiever in, in really all facets of life. Um, and 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 really, it's, it's so uncommon, but I bet the people that you hang out with, it is, it's the norm, and so it doesn't <laughs> feel so uncommon. <laughs> But it is uncommon, and you should add a boy yourself for Thank it you. because Thank it's you. amazing. I appreciate that. Um, getting your master's while you're working, which I know you just finished. So congrats, yeah. congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I've told you that before, but a public congrats. Thank you. Um, while being a newlywed. Yes. And running marathons. <laughs> <laughs> and I told everybody about the culture, all the cultural things you're yes. involved in. How did you make it through? Actually, I look back at it and the day I got my diploma, I look back and I said, wow, how, it, it, I sometimes forget, how did I do it? Yeah. And, and I think the, the complexity was, yes, that I had just gotten married, but that half of my MBA career was in person, a lot of social activities, a lot of networking, a lot of fun, auditoriums of 40, 50 students, like all the great stuff that you would want. And then unfortunately, COVID hit, right? right. So the second half of my MBA experience was virtual. And that was the hardest part is, you know, me now and I'm very extroverted. I get energy from people and I want to be with people. I want to help people being locked in all day, you know, from nine to five with my job. And then from six to 10 p.m. in, in a virtual oh classroom was was probably the most challenging thing. Uh, but but it has everything has its inverse relationship. Right. So when I was in person, you know, I, I'll, I'll admit, frankly, I was not at home a lot. And you know that that was when my wa- my wife was like, "Hey, uh, we just got <laughs> married, and I hardly ever see you. Like, who did I really marry, right?" And th- those were tough, right? Um, I'm telling you, there there were some tough conversations yeah. there. But then it's the inverse where now I'm at home all the time, and my wife is now more okay. You spend too much time inside of the uh, the home office. Let's go walk, right? But now at least I'm at home and I'm there with her, right? And we can have a dinner in between my breaks and things like that, where in the past that was not possible. So I always take everything and just try to look at the flip side, but it was probably the hardest thing to juggle work and the the you know graduate degree and just doing it all virtually those last you know couple of months it was very difficult uh, because I just missed the people interaction and and uh, luckily there was still some of the networking that was going on mm. you know people who felt comfortable meeting me you know six feet apart at a coffee shop uh, things like that but uh, but yeah I think that was one element that I'm that I'm always gonna remember was how different one year one was as opposed to year two but I, we of course still value that education piece met a lot of great people still have a lot of great friends and, and colleagues that I still see to this day and it's completely worth it, right? I was gonna say, so why was it worth it? It was still worth it, it right? Was worth it. Cause why halfway through, it I'll, I'll tell you, Carrie, there was a lot of people who just wanted out of the of the MBA when <laughs> COVID hit and said, you know, I, this is not what I signed up for. And I totally respected that. Uh, there was even some people went to the ex- extreme of wanting money back from the university, which which is a whole nother thing. But mm-hmm. I just said, said, hey, there's still value in, in learning and always improving oneself. Right. But but I still get to unlock connections and right. doors that I would have never would have thought existed if I wouldn't have opened up my boundaries and put myself in, a, in an MBA program, you know. Plus, knowing your personality, I bet the fact that, you know, you made it through that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. is probably its own set of validation. Yeah. 
from a, for a marathon runner. <laughs> yes. You ran a real marathon. Yep, I did. Yes, yes. So true. Probably the most challenging. It was. Forget Boston with the yes. rain. <laughs> <laughs> this was a marathon. This was a marathon. Graduate school. And, 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 you know, one of the things I try to always do is not let it affect my other aspects of my life, you know? Right. Like my relationship with my wife or, or my work. And, and, you know, there were sometimes maybe a little bit, right? But, but now that, it, that I'm done, you know, I just get to, relax a little bit more on on the weekends and the weeknights uh, and not having to be thinking about oh man what's that homework that I got to right. do by tomorrow right. like no I'm I'm done yeah. all of the, yeah so I'm really So can I okay yes. just I don't want to get so personal for so long but I'm curious about how you met your wife I've never asked you that question Yeah I've gotten to hear about her a little yes. bit and I've seen some wedding pictures but it's, I, I love to tell the story I'll tell you the story fast but but uh cuz it's a it's got multiple milestones but we actually met in high school Oh, but we didn't date. We were dating. Wait, where were you in high school? In El Paso. Oh, you were. Back I made by it then. back. Okay. Yes, I made a whole Got circle it. through South America, Mexico. Okay. I ended up uh, going back to El Paso for my last years in high school. Funny enough. Okay. And the story there is side note: a lot of my classmates that I had when I was in elementary school was like, "Hey, are you Jorge, the guy oh. who went to South America?" And I was like, "Yep, that's me." Did you just kind of mesh back into uh, your old crew? In a little bit, in a little That's sense, amazing. yeah. Kind of crazy how it all, you know, I love that. Um, turned back to that. But anyways, last years of high school in El Paso through a, a mutual friend who's her cousin, you know, met her and, you know, we were dating other people and, you know, we didn't have that that type of relationship at the beginning. And it was a typical, my wife is the typical person I would bump into at, you know, Thanksgiving uh, bars or after going out with family or, you know, at Christmas, I would see her in the airport and we were always like, oh, hey, you're in Dallas too, right? Oh, cool. Oh, Let's hang out. But wow. we, ne we never did. Right. Okay. And then it was probably around 20, I want to get the years right, 2015-ish. No, 16, I believe. We were uh, both working here and, you know, th the timing aligned himself where, where I wasn't dating anyone, she wasn't, and and we just kind of reconnected. And kind of kind of crazy how it worked because we kind of already knew of each other. You know, our first date didn't really feel like a first date because right. we already knew each other. Right. We were already talking about, like, kids and kids' names on our first date, which now I think about it, wow, that's kind of crazy. I could have raised a red flag there. Like, I can't believe we're already talking about kids on our first date, you know, but we just felt like so, so comfortable natural. and that we knew each other. And the craziest story I like to tell people is after we reconnected, we we probably didn't date for more than like six months before I popped the question, we were engaged. And uh, yeah, we we uh, we dated more than we were engaged. And, and you know, in such a short uh, period of time, we were already planning a wedding, so. I love that. What do you think, like, did you, first of all, did you ever think you'd be the kind of guy that just six months in? Nope. Never. I always thought I was going to be the person to wait two, three years. And, and you never second guessed it. Never second guessed it. It just felt right. See, that's what it, that's what it's about. I yep. think, you know, we have these like rules for ourselves mm -hmm. that we create some it, for protection, right? Or for whatever fear or whatever yeah. reason yeah. we do. But suddenly somebody or something hops in and you just for whatever reason the rules mm -hmm. out the Are window out. and there you go i love that story that's awesome and age has a little bit to do not not that we reconnected you know that much older but i will say i know on my end personally i i needed to have matured and grow up a little bit i, I when do you, from when you first from met, when I first met when, her to to how when we started you know dating and, and then eventually engaged yeah i, I do believe it you know, a lot of guys will give me a hard time about this. But I do believe us guys take a little bit longer to mature. So, no. Uh, uh, no, yes, completely. So it took me a while, but finally it was all about timing. And you're right. There was no, you know, reservations. It just felt right. That. No second guessing. You know, even talking to to my parents and to her parents, I did ask for her parents' permission to, to uh, marry her before I proposed. And uh, just more of a cultural thing I that, that I felt like I needed to do. But in all those conversations, there was never a... If, but, what, why, no, it was always like, yeah, you guys. Everybody just got everyone it. Everyone just understood. And that was another reflection of, hey, we're, you know, we're doing things right. And, and we're not jumping the gun. We're not, you know, uh, uh, stepping out of process. And I think it just, it just felt natural and great. Uh, and she, probably the best, the funniest surprise she got was planning the wedding. I think she thought it was just going to be her. And a lot of, you know, relationships work that way where the woman does all the planning, but you know me now very well. I'm very creative and I'm, I could be opinionated. 
and and there were a couple of surprises there that I threw at it at our wedding. That oh really? Uh, in the planning and then on the day of, yes. Give me yes. one. Give me one. The day example. of is uh, instead of doing the whole garter thing and you know removal, yeah. I basically got my groomsmen and we did a whole choreograph dance and uh, it's on social media but uh it had to do with Baxter Boys and Beyonce but we did a dance and she did not expect that and that was just my creativity coming to life and my funny personality and and yeah at that wedding I was doing a dance with my groomsmen and it was hilarious I love that though because I know and and not to take anything from from the women that want to plan their Mm -hmm. their wedding I was never the girl that planned my mom planned my wedding (laughs) it was her wedding i've been married (laughs) twice the first wedding was all sheila's um but i think it's unfair like Mm -hmm. i think there's something so romantic in having the mesh i mean it's supposed to be the union right yeah, yeah yeah so i love that and i love that you did some creative things that it doesn't sound like you stood in her way of mm-hmm. having the flowers she wanted or what what have mm-hmm. you. She got to pick her dress, but that you brought in some of your own energy and that you made it important to you also. So I think sometimes that's not really fair. <laughs> yeah. You know? I Agreed, mean, as yeah. much as like I love it that women want to do it, but I think it's it 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 deserves to have influence from yep. all parties. Definitely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I love that. Okay, now I'm going to find the dance. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to you. So without like, um, you know, throwing you a curveball, but mm-hmm. what do you see in your future? That's a good question. There's so many paths, right? And that's just how my right. mind works. You know, I'm thinking of so many things I could do that have to do with what I like. Right. And, and I've already started one thing and, and we're going to talk about it uh, in another uh, episode potentially is is what I'm going to do now with running. 100%. Yeah. I, I have uh, embarked, embarked on a venture that has to do with Dallas and showing people the city of Dallas and all the greatness of Dallas through running. Uh, so that's one little side business venture on my weekends. But I love that. The other thing is just, you know, I love this. I love podcasting. I love talking. Um, my wife's always said, oh, you would be you would be great if you did a podcast, but it requires a lot of work. I'm sure you can attest to that, you and John back there. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of work to, to do a podcast and to do it right. And uh, so, you know, but that could be another thing in the, you know, shorter to middle term uh, future, but, but long, long term, I don't know. I think we'll, we'll, we'll see what it holds, but, but I've always had a dream and a vision of also being on the TED stage. Right. Oh, that's, that's yeah. uh that's the thing that I've just always had in my mind where, of course, everyone rolls their eyes like, oh, you would want to be on the TED stage and mm-hmm. get the all the attention. But it's not about that. It's about I feel like I have some things to say. Right. We've talked about some today, creativity, you know, change, culture. But I just feel like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, God gave me this voice and this personality and I should put it to to use. Right. And, and it, you know, not there's anything wrong with being introverted and, you know, staying in your comfortable shell, but. I just love being out there and putting myself out there, right? And it comes with risks, right? But but yeah, for example, very tangible uh, goal I've had is to one day be on that stage. I don't know what I'm going to be talking about. I don't know who's going to give me the mic, but uh, that's one thing. And we'll see what the future holds. But but I am trying to also not jump too ahead and just right. take your time. I I will say I've been there's been multiple instances in my career of 10, 11 years in marketing that. That I've always wanted to just already, you know, do something else or switch companies or, and either be my dad or other people in my close circle, just like, hey, hey, Jorge, like, you're, yes, give you're very time. creative, give it time. And that's where I've learned the patience and time thing, right? Where it is important to where yeah. if, if I'm in this role, if I'm doing this one job or this, you know, side project, don't, don't get, you know, too, too antsy too early on, right? Just yeah. hold. And, uh, and yeah. Well, as an achiever, like, cause you're an ultimate achiever, that's probably going to be one of the things that's going to be hardest for you. Yeah. Um, is that, that pacing yourself? Yes. Yes. But you've learned the pacing and running. Yes, exactly. I was just about <laughs> to say that you're already thinking like me. Yeah. Yes. And the pacing in, in yeah. your relationship and, and when, when it's, when you go all in mm-hmm. six months, I know I'm going all in. And when it's time to pace, otherwise, that's probably just going to be your thing. But yep. I'll tell you what, you're going to be on that stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's no like there is no doubt in my mind. And um, I think that uh, 
not only is it that you have a voice, you have an encouragement and a way of teaching and an enthusiasm and just such a beauty to your personality you. that it's more than just the voice. The voice is beautiful, but you've got a heart that is so strong Thank you. that it the world should absolutely see it and Yes, do a podcast. Too. <laughs> Thank you. You'll listen in. You'll you'll see 100%. my show. Thank you. Hundred percent. I appreciate that. I would very, love that. Yeah. Very nice words. I yeah. That. No, it's all so true. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, I can't I loved it. wait to show them the secondary piece and yes. get into the running. Maybe yes. you can teach me a thing or two. Yes. Um, I just can't wait to keep watching you in your life. I'm just inspired by you and, and mesmerized you. by you. So. Thank you for joining. No, me. thank you for having me. You you are a great podcaster. You get the best out of people and you identify good people to talk to. So I'm just so grateful that you had me on today. My pleasure. Thank okay. you. See you soon. Bye. Hey Dallas. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Dallas Culture Club podcast. We know you have a million ways to spend your time, and we are thrilled to have you here with us. We'd love to connect with you. Go to DallasCultureClub.com and sign up to join the club. Be the first to receive our latest episodes, invitations to roundtable talks and events, and connect with other local purpose-driven individuals. Go to DallasCultureClub.com and join the club today.